building natural gas dehydration technology eliminates virtually all hydrocarbon emission and pays for itself by recovery. Could, what's virtually? 99 point something. Well, there's also flares that do the same. It says it's going to be flares. It's EPA. Additional supplemental fuel now used by flares and thermal oxidizers would also be eliminated. What's the, as far as, let me ask you this, and I'm just curious, uh, can I see that? I'm just, I've never seen one. You sure can, two men walk over and get it. Okay, I didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> can you have an extra copy of that so I can see what's, what? Hey Greg, you can bring it over to your council there. Share it with you, but it's turning time for a while. Okay, that's how I look at it. Can I copy it on that? I have an opinion of that, but I won't go there. Did, was there any cost associated with that? You'd have to read it, Greg. Right? There is cost, and there's supposed to be some savings for reusing what you're burning. I think you're, you're catching us a little off guard. Oh, that's right. That's right. And, and, and I will agree to that. I'm kind of catching you by surprise. It's new technology. But I think that's maybe something. I think a lot of the technologies and the things that people do on these sites and all, all that. I mean, you know, when you look at a, the, the flare units, especially there's a, there's other technologies and flares that are internal combustion flares that are 99.6 percent efficient. Apparently, the EPA is going to back this. Oh, the EPA will back out one too. Okay, so what I'm saying is maybe this is something to be aware of. They come to their there is some mention in there about retrofitting what the existing is. Is there, uh, like, when you look at the amount or whatever those emissions may be, then I guess we'd have to go by OSHA standards as to what we can allow to emit, EPA standards and all those governmental standards. And then you have to look at your cost and what you're going to put forth to that. And then you decide from there what your economics will allow you to do. And then you also look at what it, you know, the, the impact on communities and all your surrounding environment, and you say, you weigh those out, and that's what determines it. What we're weighing out, Greg, if you know if any emissions coming out of there, this is supposed to eliminate it, and that's attractive to us. It said virtually. Yes. Well, we virtually eliminate them as well with our flag. The EPA says this is a better <laughs> <laughs> Manufacturers have a lot of discussions on this. <laughs> Greg, what is the destruction rate on the flares that we're using? Um, I, I believe, and I would rather Nathan quote okay, that that's because... Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. We just haven't seen it, Mr. Griffin, yet. We haven't had a chance to really... I understand, but... Uh, well, that's fine. I thought it'd be a good time to introduce you to it. I like the technology. Mm -hmm. okay. I, don't I don't have any questions. The Oregon 94 Washington Avenue. Greg, uh, the flare, I know it's a good thing. We want the flare. But we haven't seen it that big. It's been over a year. I mean, since right after you put that in, the facility in, it was big for a while. And we haven't seen it since. So that my was, question is I thought there was some shielding that went around there. There is. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the flare, when you first put it in, it was big for quite a while. It was in the spring. I remember. Yeah. Then we went in the winter. What, what we have on our compressor units, and this is what affects the glycol. The compressor units have loopers, they're manually operated. We are putting in what we call hot gas bypass. If our discharge gas cools down, it creates fractionation in the tower, in the contact for the glycol contactor. And when that happens and we get cool, the glycol will absorb that much more hydrocarbon. Then whenever that goes back to the to the reboiler and the regenerator, it's going to be saturated with hydrocarbons. So that builds up. Now through the winter time, when we're running a hundred and some degree discharge gas because we pretty much close our louvers and we don't get a fluctuation in the ambient temperature that creates us to go out and adjust our louvers, then we stay at a high temperature, minimal liquids. It's just like a, a tower in our plant. Uh, same, same, same premises. Uh, the only difference is we recognize what's going on out there, and uh, I don't know what the completion dates are, but several of the sites are 
already underway, one of them is already complete, and we're putting in what we call a hot gas bypass. What that will do is it will be a PLC driven or a computer driven valves that will bypass the cooler and keep our hot gas temperature up without relying on rovers. And that will actually elim that will eliminate a large percentage of our liquids on the site's period because we want to get them in the pipeline. We don't want them on the site. So what would that mean to the, the visible flame? I would expect an occasional flame that would stay within that shroud. That shroud on top that's three feet tall or however tall that is, that is actually, the pilot is at the very bottom of that. And right now, um, which our guys go out, they look at it, there's a lot of hydrocarbon in that right now, a lot. What's a lot? Um, when I say a lot, when I look at a three-phase separator and I see uh, continuous dumping off of our three-phase separator and it's sitting there full and, and you have a valve that's always dumping, I consider that a lot because it, I, I would like to think that that glycol unit would close off, generate a level, and then dump. But it's, we get a lot of continuous dumping from it right now. And time, timeline-wise, any idea for remediation? Uh, well, I, I know all the, stu all the stuff's been bought. Those are all uh, projects that are underway uh, with every site. Uh, primarily, like I said, it, it costs us money to have liquids on the site. We want the liquids in the pipeline because then we can pick them to the plant site. Thanks, Ray. You're welcome. Bill Forrest, 62 Baker Road. Um, going back to your, the email you referred to about electrical power, what is that email in reference to? The declining the services available? No, we were setting up meetings with them. We actually took maps of all of our facilities, everything we had, and we went to Allegheny when we first came here, and we tried to find out where we could get three-phase power. Uh, even at our plant site, we ran that plant for three or four months on enormous generators. Um, required special permitting required and then finally we got the 25 kV power to the plant. The same thing's happening out in the field. It's just that it's my understanding from Allegheny's standpoint that the infrastructure of the power and the three-phase power is is it's an old infrastructure. And the only place that we can get good reliable power to run 6,000 horsepower or better on a on a site would be from a 138 kV service. Well unfortunately there's not a whole lot of that to go around in the areas where we're at. Um, if, the, if they'd have had it, we'd have definitely put it in. Uh, and that, those were what those meetings were about. Those meetings went on, and they're still going on today. Um, the gentleman they spoke of from the governmental affairs, that's an Allegheny person out of Harrisburg that I met at that media event that I finally met somebody that could get involved. And he's helped us tremendously. Uh, they are trying to figure out where they have power that's available to us. Yeah, it just seems like your reference to that email is more of a, a asking you to participate in the marketing more so. Well, that, that particular email. An application for power or those sorts of things. And it's something that came up last night. Have there been formal applications? Oh, yeah. To have that power? Well, there's, when they tell you that there's nowhere to get on a power line, there's nothing to apply for. Um, the places that we put you on, the, the main plant, um, my goodness, like a, six, we spent probably six months just negotiating with them to get power to bring it there. Um, we want three-phase power. We want it everywhere. I mean, we, we prefer it. it. It saves us a ton of money. So is that part of the normal planning process or that kind of out the window because you're saying it takes two years for any location? Oh, no, we're still planning. We're still looking at power options everywhere. Um, we want it. And, and one other question I had, you, you made reference that some, some equipment is on site, possibly, and not installed yet, as well as uh, new buildings or new insulation being on order and being manufactured. Regardless of the outcome of this appeal, are you prepared to install that insulation and those other pieces of equipment on each site? As far as... But I don't know, I guess, you mean as far as if we get our permit to move on and I guess if the permit allows the construction to, for the buildings and everything, uh, I guess then we would continue with the noise abatement as well. And you're saying if, if the permit doesn't move forward, you're not going to move forward with that? Well, I'm not in that position to say that. Um, 
that would be probably a question. I would say that you no, know, I I wouldn't even.